There are lots of things that newsrooms can do. One thing is to think about systems and to think about the flow of and the volume of potentially toxic material that their reporters and moderators have to deal with. So reducing the flow is really important. On an individual basis, that might be a question for the journalists themselves of restricting their access to devices at particular times, of using only work phones and trying to keep social phones separate from work phones. But the same thing also applies in a management level in the company. Um, how long are moderators are expected to, to work on shifts? Are they expected to always moderate the same kinds of stories? Or perhaps there are stories that are so negative or kind of difficult, particularly, for example, interviews with rape survivors, the sorts of stories that attract really vile trolls. Maybe for those stories, it's more sensible to turn commenting off. So for anybody working with a large volume of negative material, it's very useful to find ways of accentuating the positive. So look through the, look through the, the feed and find the positive comments, find the useful things. There's a, a feature of our brains is that we tend to remember um, the last thing that we came across. So it's a really good idea at the end of the shift to look through the material you've been working with and to kind of highlight and star the stuff that was interesting. Um, similarly, you know, a news organisation should try and find ways of rewarding um, people who give constructive comments. So if you look, for example, at the Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom, they've developed a way of elevating the nice comments. They get an orange box, they appear at the top of the below the lines comments feed and they get celebrated. And we can do the same thing as well behind the scenes. You can pass on positive information about things that you, you're working with as a moderator to your colleague. Um, one thing that I've heard some people do at one newspaper is that they ha have a handover document um, so that the person who's coming on the next shift gets to see the most useful comments that the previous shift read. These kinds of little things can make a big difference to people's days and it's a, really important for that you as an individual journalist and for the news editors out there, um, organisations find ways of kind of brainstorming and ways of injecting positivity into, into this work. So there are all ways, kinds of ways that organisations can think about these issues systemically. But the most important thing they can do is to set a good tone within the newsroom, a kind of create a protective understanding environment that acknowledges impact. One of the challenges, I think, in creating the right kind of tone and environment in a newsroom is that you have to do two things at the same time. One is to acknowledge the possibility of impact, but at the same time not uh, lead people into thinking that they're going to be damaged by the material they're working with. So the, the kind of proper kind of framing is to create a space where people feel empowered to discuss personal impact issues. They feel empowered to kind of reach out to their colleagues and not, but not do it in a way that implies that they'll you know, necessarily get people necessarily get into difficulty. Journalists are very resilient. We're good at bouncing back, but there may be times when we're you know, challenged by work and we need a bit of extra space, a bit of extra resources to work through the emotional implications of particularly difficult things. One thing that we get asked sometimes about is how do you screen out journalists or find, out, find journalists who might be potentially vulnerable to, to trauma? Well, the simple answer is that on an individual basis, you can't do it. Okay? There's no evidence that screening works. You can't give people questionnaires um, and necessarily locate the ones who you know, may or may not be more vulnerable. But there are some general things that we know, and most of these are common sense. First off, certain categories of journalists are more likely to come under attack. So that would include women, generally, and often the material that they're confronted with is particularly nasty. It contains threats of sexual violence. It may contain um, threats against their family and children in a way that men are less likely to encounter. Now this kind of stuff is very hard to deal with, very hard to get into perspective, very hard to separate with because the consequences, of, um, the consequences are, are potentially graver. Another group that have come particularly under attack are people from ethnic minorities. 
and may have a well-justified real-world fear of discrimination or of being targeted for abuse out there in the real world as well. So we would expect them to have more on their plate than other journalists who come from different backgrounds. There's personal life history. If people have recently been bereaved, um, struggling with relationship difficulties, all these kinds of things, then that kind of adds to the, the cup, if you like, and uh, add on trauma onto that. Maybe a journalist is working on a particularly traumatic assignment. They're also getting uh, online harassment, online abuse. Then the cup can fill up and overfill. So it's important that editors and colleagues have an eye out for each other and everybody's you know, aware of the, the kinds of challenges that people in the newsroom are facing. One difficult fact is that the more under pressure people feel, the less likely they are to reach out for help and support. And so it's a very kind of unhelpful paradox there, is that when the more people need support, the less likely they are to, to ask for it. So the best solution to that is to take a kind of newsroom-wide approach, and that involves giving everybody access to resources, um, trauma training, education, invite people into collaborative discussions in which team members talk amongst themselves about what they can do to reduce the, the toxic overload, um, to create a kind of culture where it's kind of normal and expected um, that people will kind of talk about these things. One thing that lots of news organisations have are EAPs, employment assistance providers. Um, they may have a dedicated HR department. And there's some evidence to suggest that when people are um, feeling overloaded that they don't necessarily use those resources. And so this is where peer support comes in. Peer support is the idea of giving colleagues a uh, few extra skills to be good buddies, a little bit of knowledge about trauma. They're not out there to be clinicians. It's not that question of diagnosing whether somebody's got PTSD or depression or is at risk of those things. It's not about that at all, but it's about maintaining human contact. When we feel threatened and attacked, we often hunker down into ourselves and become kind of isolated. We become less likely to reach out for support and so having people around in the office who are attentive and noticing that somebody's not doing quite so well, seems their work may be suffering, that can be really helpful. Um, one indicator of trauma trouble in an organization are things like um, staff absenteeism. When people are calling sick all the time, that could be a warning sign. What are the individual warning signs that people might not be doing so well? Well, they vary greatly. I mean, there's some classic ones like substance misuse, reliance on alcohol. Um, some people, rather than self-medicate with substances, self-medicate with work um, because doing work and getting things done makes them feel good. And also, if they're feeling vulnerable, they might become more worried about losing their job. And so people kind of tend to, you know, tend to kind of fall into patterns of overwork, which of course increases the loading particularly if they're working on traumatic topics. Also, people need to be attentive for signs that people are getting stuck in their emotions. So by that I mean um, it's perfectly normal for people to be angry about stories and to be angry about what's happening in the world. But if a journalist gets stuck in a place where they're perpetually angry, uh, in other words, the switch gets stuck in the on position and this goes on for weeks, possibly months, then that could be a warning sign. Um, another warning sign might be the reverse. If people become very passive, um, disconnected from their feelings and kind of numb, again, it's sometimes very helpful to dissociate a bit and to kind of um, distance oneself from stuff that might be challenging. But if that switch gets stuck in the on position for a long period of time and that journalist finds that they're losing enthusiasm for things that they used to enjoy, no longer feel positive emotions when they're around friends and family, that's likely to be a warning sign. There are also things, um, situations in which people start to become extremely cynical and not just cynical but also a bit sort of deadened and may say things like, there's no point to doing this, there's no value in any of this, it's all a complete waste of time. Again, 
People are likely to say that under stress occasionally, but if that becomes the default position, that would also be a warning sign.